Okay, welcome to uh, Mr. Sarasam and Srinivas Associates. We are uh, very uh, glad and uh, fortunate to have Professor Sona Bharadas from uh, Ed Parakur as the speaker of this colloquium. Uh, Professor Bharadas, he is uh, undergrad and postgrad from Ed Parakur, and then he did his PhD uh, as a CAP student. We don't, I, I don't know if you know about CAP, but it's a joint economic program. And uh, almost all the students who graduated from GAP are uh, very famous uh, astrophysicists and cosmologists all over India now. And so he's one of the first generation of GAP students. Um, so after his PhD, he did a postdoc uh, at HRI, and then he uh, went back to IIT Parakpur uh, as, as a faculty member, and he has been there ever since. He is a uh, uh, He's very popular among uh, students who take their uh, courses with him, uh, which uh, I, I hope that you see some glimpses of his uh, teaching prowess today. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> his, uh, he has, we just came uh, to know that he has about 17 or 18 PhD students who have graduated for with him. So he's a, he's a lot of research. And actually, uh, most of the students who do their MSc two year at Parakpur. Many of the students uh, try to do their project with Professor Bharadwaj, and there's a big queue uh, outside his office. <laughs> so I figured it's you. Um, so so uh, very good to join him as as PhD students. If some of you know one of our former faculty members, Professor Kanand so he was a PhD student with Professor Bharadwaj, mm -hmm. um, and uh, so he is. Field of research is the organization as you hear. There are many stories about Professor Bharadwaj. Some of which can be said in an open platform, some may not be, but, but one thing that uh, so, you know, our colleague, Kedisa, uh, uh, used to tell us that uh, Professor Bharadwaj always told the students that you cannot work all the time. You can work only in, in given amount of time of the day, but the rest of the time you should go play football in the field or do some exercise or do something like that. Um, so I was trying to find out if there is some connection between this uh, statement and reionization in the sense that <laughs> that not everything, uh, you know, various contribution of reionization comes from reionization, but I couldn't find anything. That's why I was stalling to find the connection. <laughs> but anyway, so I hope that in the talk also you will find uh, that not everything is just uh, you know just uh, hard work, difficult mathematics, but there is some fun also in, in this research. Uh, so we, without delaying much, Professor. So thank you very much for this invitation and for the very kind introduction. 
So I was warned that people will sit mainly on this side. <laughs> okay. So my apologies to people who are sitting on this side. <laughs> I am leaning to the right. <laughs> this cannot be an indication of my political influence. <laughs> And, uh, and I hope I live up to you the expectations that have been raised here. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, actually, what happens is we record the talk. So, so if you go too far from the mic. Right, right. Down, so I will uh, stick to this position. Right. Not only, not only they are dictating your kind of politics, also your movement. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I'm going to talk about cosmology with the redshifted H1 21 centimeter line. And my apologies to uh, experts in the audience. Uh, I'm assuming that people don't know much of uh, cosmology and astrophysics. So it's intent, it's targeted for a general physics audience. And uh, <clears throat> just to tell you what these pictures are, this is the uh, building where I sit, somewhere in this side of the building. This was the Hidley Detention Center, and this is where the IIT system started. This is the uh, present IIT building, and this is the logo. So <clears throat> let me start up. Yeah. So <clears throat> to, to set the background, we know that we live in an expanding universe. So let me uh, put this in context. So uh, imagine. What do we mean by this expanding universe? That's the point I'm trying to uh, explain to you. This is the background for everything that I'm going to say. So imagine a part of the universe here. And uh, I have put a grid in that part of the universe. You can think that there is a galaxy sitting at every grid point here in this picture. So there is a galaxy sitting at every grid point. This is a part of the universe. The same part of the universe at a later time looks like this. The separation between every galaxy has increased, but you should not ima imagine that the universe is empty outside this. This is just a part of the universe. The entire universe is filled with galaxies and it, this whole thing extends in all directions. At a later time, the same thing looks like this. So this, basically the intergalactic separation is increasing with time. That is what we mean by the expanding of the universe and the whole universe is filled with galaxies. Okay. As a consequence of this, what happens? So imagine that, sorry, uh, imagine that there is a source which is far away from where is light, from where light is coming to me. And uh, the source emits light at a wavelength lambda emitted. Because of the expansion of the universe, the wavelength of this radiation increases as it propagates. And what the observer here will see is the wavelength lambda observed it in will be lambda emitted into 1 plus z where z is what i'm going to refer to as redshift okay so the point is that because of this expansion of the universe the radiation from distant observers the wavelength increases as it propagates to me this is the consequence of the expansion of the universe okay so <clears throat> So same point, and let me just dwell on it once more. So I'm the observer sitting here, and the observer is receiving radiation from different locations, and this radiation is getting redshifted. So the wavelength, same radiation, if it comes from here, will be observed at a larger wavelength, and the wavelength at which the radiation will be observed is the emitted wavelength into 1 plus z. And the further away the radiation is coming from, the larger the redshift. So we can observe the redshift, and from there we can infer where the how far away the radiation is coming from. And the radiation takes time to propagate. So not only are we looking further out, larger redshift, not only does it mean that we're looking further out, but we are also looking further back in the past because light takes a finite time to propagate. Right. So in this entire talk. I'm going to use the word redshift to indicate two things. One is distance. So the larger the redshift, the further away the source is. Larger the redshift, the further back in time that I'm looking. Two things. 
Okay. So this is the point that needs to be borne in mind. This is the first thing. So I'm trying to explain the title basically. The title of the talk is redshifted H1 21 centimeter lines. I'm, I have given a picture of what I mean by redshift. Now, what is this 21 centimeter line? So H1 here in my talk refers to neutral hydrogen. This is spectroscopic notation. H2 would be ionized hydrogen. And neutral hydrogen in the ground state of the atomic transitions has proton and electron, which both have spins. So the spins could now, the ground state is has two hyperfine states in it. It's not a single state. And these, there could be a transition between these two states. So the spins of the proton and the electron could be aligned or they could be counter aligned and there's an energy difference between these two. This energy difference corresponds to a transition at a frequency of 14, 20 megahertz or 21 centimeters. And if the hydrogen is far away, then we shall receive the radiation at a larger wavelength. One, so the observed wavelength will be this 21 centimeter into 1 plus z, the observed frequency will be 1420 megahertz divided by 1 plus z. Okay. So this is what I mean by this H1 21 centimeter line. Wherever you have neutral hydrogen in the down state, you will have this transition at 21, which emits 21 centimeter radiation. And that radiation is going to get redshifted by the time it comes to the observer. Okay. Now, why are we interested in this 21 hydrogen and the 21 line centimeter line emanating from hydrogen. We are interested in this for this particular reason that if you look at the constituents of the universe, we now know that the universe uh, around 70% is something called dark energy, which we don't know what it is. We don't see it directly. Of the remaining 30%, around 26% is something called dark matter, which also we don't see directly. And we have indirect evidence. Only 4% is baryons. Baryons, the protons and the neutrons, which make up everything that you see here, they only make up 4% of the known density of the universe at present. Of this 4%, which are the baryons, 26% is hydrogen by weight and 20, 25 and 75, roughly one fourth and three fourths are hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen is the most abundant known constituent of the universe, which is why we are interested in this transition in the hydrogen atom. Okay, please feel free to interrupt me if you have any question at any point in the talk. Okay. So we are talking about this radiation which comes from neutral hydrogen, the hyperfine transition in neutral hydrogen. And which uh, corresponds to a radiation at 21 centimeter or 14, 20 megahertz. Okay. Now, the next important concept is the concept of spin temperature, Ts. So, we're talking about these two states, which are the two hyperfine states of neutral hydrogen. And if you ask the question that what is the ratio of the number density of atoms, hydrogen atoms in the excited state to the number density of hydrogen atoms in the ground state, so excited and ground state, N1 and 0. <clears throat> if this transition is in thermal equilibrium, then this will be given by this Boltzmann relation, G1 by G0, where these are the degeneracies of these two states, T and 1 respectively, e to the power minus H nu by kBt, which I have written like this, minus T by T star where T star is this other factor, H nu by Kb, the Boltzmann constant. Okay. This temperature is what we refer to as the spin temperature. This temperature essentially quantifies the ratio of the number density of atoms in the excited state of the hyperfine transition to the number density of atoms in the ground state of the hydrogen. Okay. This we quantify through this quantity called the spin temperature. If it were in thermal equilibrium, if the spin transition were in thermal equilibrium with the kinetic with the motion of the gas, then this would be equal to the kinetic temperature of the gas. Okay. Oops. 
Right. Let me also introduce another very important quantity which in cosmology, another very important thing in cosmology, which is the cosmic microwave background. Okay. So what is this cosmic microwave background radiation? I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this, but this is for the benefit of those of you who do not know about this. Okay. If you take a radio receiver, which works in the millimeter wave, and you point it towards the sky, you will find that there is a radiation coming to us from all directions. Whichever direction you point it, that's what I've tried to show in this picture. You take a receiver and point it outwards. So the observer is sitting here. You take a receiver and point it outwards. You, towards the sky, you will see that there is a radiation coming to us from all directions. Nearly isotropic from all directions. Okay. And the spectrum of this radiation has been measured. It is found to be a black body. A very, to a high level of precision. A black body with a temperature of 2.73 Kelvin. So we are receiving this radiation which has a black body spectrum from all directions. And we believe that this radiation fills the entire universe. It is cosmological. It is not just something local. Okay, so the whole universe is filled with this radiation. That is the picture that you have. Okay, and we are sitting here and receiving this radiation coming to us from all directions. That is the basic idea. Okay, that's the interpretation that we have. Oops. Right. Now, if you take this radiation, which is coming to us now at a temperature of 2.73 Kelvin, and ask the question that in the past, in the past, so past means higher redshift. In the past, what was the temperature of this radiation? Past means higher, higher larger distance from us, not only at a, at a distance from us, but a higher redshift. So in the past, you can work out, to go through the mathematics, I'm not going through it here, but in the past, the temperature of this radiation would have been 2.73 into 1 plus Z. Okay, the wavelength would have, the frequency would have increased in the past, which I have told you. And the temperature would also increase in the past like this. By the time you get to a redshift of 1000, redshift of 1000 means way back in the past and very far away also. So by the time you get to a redshift of 1000, this, this radiation, temperature of this radiation is around 3000 Kelvin. It is adequately hot to have ionized all the hydrogen in the universe. Okay. So, this is the picture which is showing you this radiation and you go backwards and backwards, further back in the past, further back in distance, further back in time. So, at a redshift of 1000, this radiation was hot enough to have ionized everything. Once the universe is ionized, once the hydrogen is all ionized, the radiation cannot propagate freely. It undergoes Thomson scattering. So this, beyond this surface, the radiation which is coming to us from here, coming to us, would have undergone Thomson scattering continuously. Okay. So the radiation in, in practice originates from a surface which is at a redshift of 1000. And this is a, what we are seeing is the radiation actually originating from a redshift, from a surface at a redshift of 1000. The radiation is uniform to a high level of precision. You subtract out the uniform part, you will see that there are tiny fluctuations of the order of tens of mi milli uh, micro Kelvin. Okay, tens of micro Kelvin. And these fluctuations have been measured by various satellite instruments or even from Earth also. And this is a picture of those fluctuations which have been measured by this satellite called Planck. Uh, not Planck, MAP, W MAP. Okay, this is a picture of of the fluctuation in this radiation of the which have been recorded by this instrument called WMAP. There are more precise measurements of this by another satellite called Planck, which has succeeded this. But this gives you an idea of what I'm talking about. So there is a radiation coming to us, which is cosmological, it fills the entire universe. 
the if you go back in the past or you go back in distance from us, the temperature of this radiation increases at a redshift of 1000. It's hot enough to have ionized everything. Beyond that, the radiation cannot propagate much. And so as far as we are concerned, the radiation for us originates from there. You take out the mean temperature of 2.73, then you will notice that there are tiny fluctuations of the order of tens of microfarads. Okay. So, yeah. so this is the picture that I will be uh, extensively referring to. So let me explain this picture. In this picture, I am the observer sitting at the origin and looking out at the universe. Okay. I am the observer sitting at the origin looking out at the universe and I am receiving radiation from neutral hydrogen. The radiation originates at 1420 megahertz or 21 centimeters, but by the time it comes to me, it gets redshifted. So when the radiation from here, a redshift of around 10 or so comes to me, 8 or 9, right? It will be at a frequency, I will be receiving it at a frequency of around 140, 150 megahertz. So the radiation which was emitted at 1420 megahertz, if it is coming to me from a redshift of around 9, I will receive it at 140 megahertz. Okay. And if it were at a redshift of 1000, I would receive it at 14 megahertz. Okay, so different, the same radiation I will receive at different frequencies depending on the redshift from where it is originated. And the red, higher the redshift, the further the distance. So this is the picture which is showing you this. So this axis is basically the frequency at which I will be receiving the radiation here. This is the redshift. Okay, by a redshift of 1000, the entire hydrogen is ionized. So above this, in this side, the entire hydrogen is ionized. This radiation, which I was talking about, the cosmic microwave background radiation, cannot propagate far, it gets scattered, under those Thompson scattering. Okay, once the universe becomes neutral at a redshift of 1000, this radiation propagates to us straight. No more scattering. But it propagates to us through this neutral hydrogen. Okay. And as a consequence of that, what happens? is this. So we have this situation where this cosmic microwave background radiation, which has a temperature of T gamma, it is propagating to us through this neutral hydrogen, which is there in the universe. Okay. And depending on the spin temperature of the hydrogen, if the spin temperature is more than the temperature of this, it will absorb, the hydrogen will absorb the radiation. If the spin temperature is less than this, sorry, other way around, if the spin temperature is less than this, it will absorb the radiation. If the spin temperature is more, it will you will see it in emission on top of this radiation. Whatever it is, you will see something at different frequencies, which will be imprinted because of the hydrogen along the line side. Okay. And the hydrogen will be imprinted at different frequencies depending on where the hydrogen is located. So we are going to see this on top of the CMDR. Right? And what we will see is this that. The hydrogen density and the properties of the spin temperature is not the same everywhere. So it is going to vary with angle. So the imprint of the hydrogen is not only going to vary with frequency, but it's also going to vary with angle. And frequency will tell us where it is coming from, what distance. And angle, depending on the state of the hydrogen there. So the state of the hydrogen along the line of sight will get imprinted in the radiation that I am receiving, this background radiation that I am receiving here. Right? And what we will measure are the brightness temperature fluctuations. This is what we will measure. Okay. And this is the formula which allows us to calculate that. Our contribution was uh, this uh, part here, let me, which is the term due to peculiar velocities. So this formula allows us to calculate the brightness temperature fluctuations as the radiation from here passes through the hydrogen and comes to us over here. Okay. 
So basically, it will depend on various things, the peculiar velocity the, of the hydrogen, the density fluctuations of the hydrogen, which could be due to large-scale structure formation or due to reionization, which I will discuss, or due to spin temperature fluctuations, various things which are all there in this equation. Okay, but let me not go into the mathematics of this equation. The, <clears throat> the main point is that if the spin temperature is more than the... <clears throat> Is uh, less than the uh, is the less than the semi temperature it will absorb. If the spin temperature is more than the spin tem uh, the semi temperature it will emit. And you will see these features in the background radiation. And uh, sorry, these features will occur at very low frequencies. At very low frequencies, this part of the same of this CMB spectrum, which is not measured over here. Okay, this extends up to a certain frequency, but what I'm talking about are very low frequencies, right? Meter wavelengths. 1420 itself is 21 centimeters and is getting stretched, right? So it is getting stretched into the meter wavelength. So the wavelengths we are talking about are of the order of meters, whereas the wavelengths here are of the order of millimeters and centimeters. Okay. So we are talking about features which are introduced in this same background radiation, which is a black body radiation. So it extends everywhere. This is the Rayleigh genes part. And we are going to be talking about things in this part of the spectrum. Okay. Right. So this is the thing that we are talking about in this talk. Okay. So the hydrogen is introducing features in this radiation, background radiation, which is coming to us from the last scattering cell. Okay, the phosphoric microwave background radiation. Now, let me <laughs> discuss the evolution of the hydrogen, right? So, this is a probe of the evolution of the hydrogen. Let me discuss the evolution of the hydrogen, right? So, the evolution of the hydrogen can roughly be divided into three parts. I have divided into three. Actually, there are four parts. The fourth part I have not put here explicitly. But let me start with this. So, you see, at the redshift of 1000, the universe first became neutral. So you have neutral hydrogen for the first time. Before this, there is no question of neutral hydrogen because the universe is ionized. Right. So the, this signature becomes possible first at a redshift of 1000. And we are in the part of this part of the universe is called, this stage in the evolution of the universe is called the dark age. There are no luminous sources at those redshifts. So at present, in the day sky, for example, you have, this, you have the sun. At night, you see stars. They're all part of our galaxy, right? With a telescope, you can see galaxies outside. But so there are all these sources of light which, you have, which are there, which fill our night sky. But at, at these redshifts, at a redshift of 1,000, or up to a redshift of around 50 or 40, there were no sources in, this, in the universe. There were just tiny fluctuations which you saw in that picture, the phosphate of the microwave background radiation. So the universe at that epoch had only tiny matter perturbations. There were no structures which had formed. Okay. And the hydrogen at that epoch. So this picture shows you the evolution of the spin temperature and the CMB temperature during that epoch. Okay. So the CMB temperature just scales as 1 plus Z. The hydrogen spin temperature behaves like this. Okay, this is the behavior of the spin temperature. This is the hydrogen gas temperature. Till a certain redshift, the, the spin temperature follows the gas temperature and the gas temperature falls below the CMB temperature. And during this epoch, you can see the hydrogen in absorption against the CMB around a redshift of 200 to a redshift of 50 or so. You can see the hydrogen in absorption and uh, the brightness temperature that you will see is going to fluctuate with direction of the sky and with frequency because the hydrogen density is also going to fluctuate. Those are the large scale structures, the seeds of the large scale structure which were imprinted there. And if you can measure these fluctuations in the brightness temperature, you can actually probe the universe during this redshift range, that during the dark ages. And this is possibly the only way you can probe the dark ages. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so this is. Does it also mean that within a certain uh, redshift, 
Yes. So you will not see it here. No, that's fine. That's and you will not see it here also. Yeah. Okay. But then something else happens over here. This picture goes all the way to a redshift of 10 or something, but something else starts happening, which I'm going to discuss. Okay. Question was that, I mean, okay, uh, this 21 centimeter line, this flip, okay. that flip occurs when uh, the skin temperature. The flip keeps on occurring, but it will be in equilibrium with the CFB temperature. And you won't see any signature of it. Right. Only if the skin temperature is lower or higher, you will see the signature. And there is a redshift range where you will not see any. Okay. Not see any signature. But then by the time you are at a redshift of around 30, 40, what happens? You start forming the first structures. Okay. And once you form the first structures, the entire scenario changes. Okay. So you have something called the cosmic dawn, which I'm not going to really talk about. But let me explain to you what happens here. Okay, this is the epoch of reionization, which I'm going to talk about. It is preceded by what is called the cosmic dawn. I'm not going to distinguish between these two, but there is something very interesting which happens in the cosmic dawn also, but I'm not going to really touch upon that separately. Okay, but the basic idea is as follows. So let me explain the basic idea. So you, you see, I have already showed you a picture of showing you a picture of the cosmic microwave background radiation. In this radiation, you have tiny fluctuations of the order of tens of microkelvin. The universe at a very high redshift is very close to being homogeneous, with only tiny fluctuations of the order of tens of microkelvin. Very, very small fluctuations. Okay. In contrast, so this is at a redshift of 1000, very early in the universe. Okay. In contrast, I am the observer sitting here in this picture, and this shows you the galaxy distribution in one of the redshift surveys that you gave. Okay. You, each point here is a galaxy. Each point in this picture is a galaxy, and this is a particular galaxy which I've shown you. Okay. If you look at the distribution of galaxies, you will see that they are not uniformly distributed. There are more galaxies somewhere, less galaxies somewhere else, and they form this structure called the cosmic web. Okay, so you see that there are big fluctuations. The galaxy itself is a big fluctuation in the matter density. So you have a picture where early in the universe you had tiny fluctuations. Presently, you have very big fluctuations in the density of the universe, matter distribution in the universe. Question is, how did the universe evolve from here to here? Tiny fluctuations to large fluctuations. Okay, so we believe that there is this process called gravitational instability, which <laughs> by which this happens. Okay. And this process is dominated by dark matter. So what happens in this process, you put tiny fluctuations in the matter density here, where there is an over density, where the matter density is slightly higher, it will attract matter from elsewhere, where it is slightly lower, the matter will flow out. Okay. And this process continues, the fluctuations grow, and they give you these structures that you see here. Okay, that is the picture that we have. And not only that, we also believe that this process happens in a hierarchical fashion, in the sense that the we form small scale structures bound objects first. These merge to form bigger objects. These form to these merge to form even bigger objects. Okay. So we have a picture where there is gravitational instability. There were tiny fluctuations which grow. And initially you form these small objects which merge to form bigger objects, which merge to form even bigger objects, hierarchical structure formation. Okay, this all happens in the dark matter. Dark matter is the dominant gravitating, self-gravitating component of the universe. Okay, now, so what happens is that you form dark matter halos like the picture I showed you. Now the baryons, they are, they follow the dark matter to a large extent. So these baryon flows into these dark matter halos inside which you form the first stars and black holes. And once you form stars and black holes inside galaxies, potentially, they emit ultraviolet and X-ray radiation, which can ionize the hydrogen. 
Okay. So you have this picture here where you form the first galaxy around the redshift of 30 and they emit radiation which ionizes the material around it, hydrogen around it. And like the picture here, right, it schematically shows that. So you form a galaxy and that emits ionizing radiation. So you have H2 ionized region and the outside is still neutral. Okay, this is the picture what that we have. Right. So once you form luminous objects, they start to ionize the neutral hydrogen. Okay. I think that will have to be. Yeah. Yeah, if you see, if you take the, the cursor on the black side, yeah, there is a three, there is a red plate. Uh, I, I, I've got it, I've got the orientation wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Is it on or? Yeah, if you click on it, you can come up. Right okay. on here. Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, Ah. Ah, I was turning around and. You uh, Oh, okay, okay. Okay, we can try it later then. Jodi, it bubble grow to dakhab into. Acha, let me. So it doesn't have the, the thing it plays with you. That's possible, yeah. Okay. Sorry, but we can we can try yeah. it later. Yeah. So the picture, let me just describe in words. Well, the picture can paint the how worth it? Thousand words. <laughs> in a few words, let me try to explain to you what happens. So what happens is that you this entire thing which I talked about that you form these small bubbles around the first galaxy and then they grow and they merge and finally the entire universe is ionized. Okay, so let me, here, you can see it here actually. This is a schematic diagram. So you can see that there are small bubbles being formed around the first uh, luminous object and these bubbles grow in time and later on the entire universe, it fills, they connect up and then the entire universe is ionized. Okay, so this is what happens. This is called the epoch of the ionization. It is preceded by the cosmic dawn, which I have not talked about. But during the epoch of reionization, two things happen. The, the hydrogen gets ionized gradually. So you have this big thing where you have bubbles and these bubbles grow, they merge. And by a redshift of six, the entire thing is hydrogen is ionized. Further, the hydrogen is heated. So the spin temperature exceeds the CMB temperature and it is seen in emission. Okay, two things happen. By a redshift of six, all the diffuse neutral hydrogen is ionized and you're left with a completely ionized universe, but there is still neutral hydrogen. It is all inside galaxies. Okay, all inside galaxies, which are very dense. So you don't have any diffuse hydrogen, but you do have hydrogen inside these clumps, which are galaxies. Okay. Here also the hydrogen appears in emission. Okay. So you see the 21 centimeter line in emission. Okay. And we know that the, the hydrogen emits the exist during this redshift range from damped Lyman alpha observers. And we also have an idea of the amount of hydrogen that is there. This picture shows you that these are absorption lines in quasar spectra. And uh, right, uh, this movie also, there's another movie here, which again may not work. Uh, may or may not work. No. No, okay. Yeah, maybe we can see it later. Okay, so. 
the basic idea is that after in the post reionization era, if you can study the 21 centimeter radiation, you can follow the growth of large scale structures. Okay, you can follow the growth of the cosmic wave. Okay, so finally, what do you observe? What do you hope to observe? So the, you can using this radiation, you can observe the entire evolution of hydrogen in the universe, which gives you a picture of the evolution of the universe itself. Okay. During the dark ages, you can study the small, I will, I will talk about that. Okay. But the basic thing is that you will observe brightness, temperature fluctuations because the hydrogen is not uniformly distributed. There are fluctuations in the hydrogen. You will observe hydro, the brightness, temperature fluctuations and it will fluctuate with angle and with frequency, both. Okay. So on the sky and as a function of frequency, you will observe brightness, temperature fluctuations. And then we can, what we do is we take the Fourier transform of this and we study it as a function of the wave vector k. And we look at the square of the amplitude of these expansion coefficients, which gives us what is called the power spectrum. Right. So the power spectrum essentially tells us the amplitude of the, the square of the amplitude of the fluctuation as a function of the wave number. So we decompose these fluctuations into Fourier modes and we square them, divide by the volume. This is what we use to quantify these fluctuations statistically. And <clears throat> this is a picture. So this uh, gives you an idea of what of the video I was trying to show you. So let me take you through this picture carefully. You can see this is an early epoch in the evolution of the universe. Then you have these small bubbles forming. These bubbles grow and they grow. And finally, they merge. These bubbles merge. You see, you have very large ionized regions. And if you evolve it even further, you will get completely ionized. Okay. This is the power spectrum of the 21 centimeter brightness temperature fluctuations scaled with this factor. It gives us an idea of the <coughs> of the brightness temperature fluctuations that you expect to measure as a function of the length of the wave number. Okay. They are of the order of tens of milliseconds square. So the galactium here is a screen temperature. No, no, no. This is the brightness temperature. Brightness. Brightness. What do you measure? Okay. This is the brightness temperature fluctuation. These are different redshifts. These are different redshifts starting from here and ending here. Okay, so this is at a redshift of around 13 and this is at a redshift of around 7. That's the effective power spectrum. These are the power spectrum. Power spectrum multiplied by the k cube and divided by 2 pi square. Brightness temperature. Okay, just to give you a feel for the numbers of the quantity that we want to measure. That's 0.1. Mini Kelvin square. Yeah, the blue one. I think redshift 7 probably. Yeah. Yeah, actually, seven is the blue one, the light blue one. Right. So that, because the others, I don't see any big kind of thing, but here you see a big. Uh, uh, the scale of this bubble. Yeah, it has to do with the scale of the bubbles. It does have to, yeah. Not so simple, but it has some, some uh, imprint of the. Right, right. Right. Yeah, two pi Right. Yeah, 60. So that may be, it, it is related to the bubble radius. Okay, but not so straightforward. Okay. And just to give you a feel, this is the power spectrum of the dark matter fluctuation, which has been extensively measured. And we we hope to measure the power spectrum using these 21 centimeter observations. And we can do this at a large number of redshifts. <clears throat> okay, so that is what I have here in the next slide. So what is... So this, what is it that we hope to do? So you see, we have these observations of the cosmic microwave background radiation at a redshift of 1000, which gives us a picture like this of the universe at a redshift of 1000, tiny fluctuations. And we can use this to measure the power spectrum to a lot of interesting cosmology. We have redshift surveys, which extend, maybe they extend a little further now, but they are largely limited to low redshifts over here. And they give us an image picture of the universe in the universe around us. But the redshifted 21 centimeter radiation, if you can do these observations, they will allow us to probe this entire range, large part of this entire range. Okay. The structure for the structures in the universe 
over this huge volume. Okay, so this is the basic idea. Okay. And let me give you a mini summary before I proceed. So this is the theoretical background of what we this whole subject is about. So you see fluctuations of the redshift at 21 centimeter radiation. Let us probe allow in principle will allow us to probe large volume of the universe. Right. We can start all the way from the dark ages when there were no sources there. Then how the universe got reionized, the first galaxies that were formed, we can study the imprint of that, how they reionized the universe, and then we can study the universe around us also, and use this to study various things like dark energy in the universe around us. Okay, so this, <clears throat> here I have tried to summarize all the things that we hope to do if we can measure this radiation. Okay, this is the basic idea. So if you have any questions, you can ask now about this part of the talk. How much time do I have left? Okay. 20 minutes. What time is it now? 3 minutes. Okay. Fine. So this was a kind of the background of what of this whole thing. Okay. Now, right. The biggest challenge, why are we not doing this? Right. What is the, what are the difficulties? So we want to measure this radio in this radiation, which comes to us at very low wavelengths. You should note that it comes to us at very low wavelengths, meter wavelengths, 21 centimeter redshifted tree. It's one meter, right? Four times that redshift four is around one meter. So <clears throat> this radiation is embedded in other sources of radiation, which are there. So this picture shows you a picture of our galaxy. This so-called Haslab map. Okay, this is a picture of the sky actually, not of our galaxy. This is a picture of the sky. Okay. <clears throat> At around some 700 megahertz. And you can see that it is dominated by our own galaxy. This is our own galaxy. This, and our galaxy has all kinds of things coming out of it. So there is this radiation whose temperature can go up to tens of thousands of Kelvin on the sky, which is filling the entire sky. This is our galaxy. So this is one of the major challenges for detecting this radiation. Okay, these are called programs. So anything else other than this 21 centimeter radiation is called a program. This is one of the programs, our own galaxy. Okay, and <clears throat> we have been doing, we have done observations to try and detect this. So uh, I'm going to show you a small, um, an observation of this small part of the sky shown over there, which is the JMRT field of view, roughly, here. So these are 150 megahertz observations. And you can see that these are the details of the observation. I will not go into that. Okay. But you can see that this is the picture of the observational field, which we made the image. Okay. This is this observation was at around 150 megahertz, which corresponds to a redshift of nine, the epoch of reionization. Okay. In this observation, you can see all these points here. These points are extragalactic point sources, basically AGMs, things you study, right? Radio galaxies. So they are all radio galaxies which are there. And they are much brighter than what we want. Their contribution is much brighter than what we want to study. Okay, these are programs. So in addition to the diffuse radiation from our own galaxy, we also have these extra galactic point sources which are there. Okay, so what we did in this particular work, we modeled these point sources and removed them. Okay, we modeled these point sources and removed them. And then we looked at what is left after that. Okay, so after we remove these point sources, the image looks something like this. You can see some diffuse structures. These diffuse structures are the galactic synchrotron radiation, which I showed you in that Haslam map, but on that very small angular scale. So the, the map which I showed you there doesn't have those small angular scales. So these were the measurements of that same radiation, which extend down to small angular scales. 
And this is the power spectrum of that radiation in this map. So this is the power spectrum, angular power spectrum of the of the diffuse galactic synchrotron radiation. It shows the power law. This itself is something of interest to people who study the galactic uh, synchrotron radiation, the inter interstellar medium. And uh, this is uh, this arises due to MHD plasma in the. Uh, oh, you remove some point sources and then you can look at what's there. Right, so we are subtracting out point sources. So this, uh, the upper plot is without doing any subtraction. The lower plot is after subtracting. This is the pit. Okay, power law at small scales, small, at large angular scales, you still have the point source. That's the other way around. At large angular scales, you have the power law, but small angular scales, you still have the point sources. Yeah. Okay. Well, you model the point sources. From the image itself. There is no external model. Okay. There is no external model. So we model the point sources from the image itself. You can mask it. You just model it. Just what could be the concentration? Uh, you cannot mask it. That is a radio astronomical yeah. image. Okay. So there's no uh, I mean there's no di there's no way to mask it that way. Okay. The other point to note is that these yeah. <clears throat> You see the values here, they are orders of magnitude larger than what we want to measure. These are of the, right, we want to measure something in uh, millikelvin square, tens of millikelvin, and these are in the Kelvin range. So it's a very difficult problem one has to model and get rid of this. Okay, that is the issue. Okay, four grams. So, so we have been working on this in addition to doing theory, but removing and modeling and removing the foreground is one of the biggest challenges in this, uh, uh, in this area. How do you decide that your modeling is perfect? No, it is not perfect. perfect. Let's say, no, no. So what I mean is that yeah. you have a point source. Right, right. Okay, so that will be a combination of uh, uh, sun plasma, right? So that is the combination of radiation, right? So all those non thermal radiations will have a different dependence. No, no. So if it's a point source, it is localized on the sky, right? right? So I model whatever is localized on the sky and move it. See the radiation I am I am interested in is diffuse. It's it's a, it extends over the whole thing. So I no, what I mean to say is that uh, whether <laughs> some configuration remain remains. Yeah, yeah, it, it will remain definitely. It can remain. Yeah. We don't use the spectral information here. Yeah. Yeah. We try to remove them as yeah. best as we can. I mean, do you take a Gaussian or something? Ah, so we no no. So what we do? Okay, you want to know the technical details? Then we first model the. I mean, we make a model for the point source on the sky. And then we go back to the visibility. So this is all radio interferometric visibility. We subtract it from the visibility. But the way that's the way we are doing it. Okay. We subtract it from the visibilities, and then again we so there is always a chance. I mean, there is not a chance, there definitely is some contamination. Yeah, but it's statistical. I mean, yeah, no, no, the contamination is a big problem. I don't know. I mean, it's a big problem. Okay. No, what you said is a valid question in the sense that the contamination still remains. It remains. And there are sources, sources fainter than this, which are definitely still there. Yeah, that, that, that can still there. Right. Can and there are artifacts of this also in that image. If you look at the, I mean, I have just showed you one image, right? I have not showed you what remains after I subtract this. I have showed you one image where I have shown it. Right. This image. So some of this is artifact, definitely. Right. So if I make a high resolution, you see, this is a low resolution event. So point source artifacts will not be so visible. I have not, I, if I make a high resolution image, you will not see this. What you will see are only the artifacts. Okay. So after, I mean, this image, this image, after I remove the point sources, what will happen is that next to the bright sources, there will be artifacts left in there. Okay. So the, you see what happens, the phases get corrupted. There are all kinds of complications in the radio astronomical imaging. So, so there will be artifacts. I can manage that, that cannot be helped. Okay. <laughs> the ionosphere is fluctuating. One, at 150 megahertz, the ionosphere keeps on fluctuating. Right. So all the phases get corrupted. And all kinds of complications are there. Our calibration is not perfect. 
So there will be artifacts that cannot be held. This is a few hours, they're very small. I think the details are given there from five hours. You have to do the case calibration. Yeah, yeah, we have to do case calibration. There are phase, I mean, <clears throat> so there are uh, uh, phase calibrators which we keep on observing once in a while. And then we also do a, what's it called, a self calibration thing, right? So all that is done. And uh, I mean, but still the phases are, you know, you cannot, you don't, you cannot carry, calibrate it manually, fully. The ionosphere keeps on fluctuating, the instrument has some fluctuation, right? So it's not so easy. This Right. So our, uh, I mean, so the main point here was that foregrounds are a big, are the big challenge in this field. Okay, removing the foreground. Our work in this area started by with this paper a long time ago. One of the first papers in this field, post ionization, so called. Now it's called intensity mapping, and it was largely motivated by the GMRT, and we have been working on that since then, nearly two decades now. And uh, I, then, just, I just like to say that the, go back to the previous one. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> so, the second author of that paper is our next week's speaker. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> if we have to call him now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, there have been now many instruments after that. Uh, which have been built, and there are other instruments which are which are, which are not shown here. This slide itself is pretty old, right? So this is a. I mean, there are many people working on this uh, uh, on this thing on this in this field. And uh, so, what's the idea? Let me. How do we? Let me give you some idea of how we do this. Okay, since we have some time. Uh, so you see, what happens is as follows. You see. The, the idea that we have been working on is as follows. So you have the, an interferometer like the GMRT, which has got many antennas, right? Any pair of antennas here. So this is a pair of antennas. It works like a Young's double slit experiment. Okay. So just imagine a Young's double slit experiment where you send the same, same signal to both these antennas, like a slit, two slits. You're sending a parallel beam, a wave front, which is like this or a parallel beam of light coming like this, right? which is equivalent to sending the same signal with the same phase to, to both these antennas. So what happens is that when you do send such a signal, a Young's double slit experiment, it produces an interference pattern like this on the slide. Okay. So this spacing between the maxima of that interference pattern is basically lambda by t. Right. So the quantity of interest, so it's useful to measure the antenna separation in units of lambda. That is called a baseline. Okay, u, u, which is d by lambda. And the angular spacing of the intensity pattern is 1 by u, basically. Okay, now imagine that instead of sending out radiation, it is receiving radiation. So we take the electric field here and here and correlate them at a correlator with no phase delay, exactly, right? It's just pointing upwards, suppose. So then what will happen, this will only be sensitive to such an interference pattern, such a pattern, intensity pattern on this guy. This pair of antennas will record only one Fourier component of the bright intensity fluctuations in the sky, exactly this one, which it will produce if you send the signals out, okay? So every antenna separation essentially records a single Fourier component of the brightness temperature fluctuation on the sky. That is the basic idea. Okay. Each antenna separation records one Fourier component of the brightness temperature fluctuation on the sky. And that Fourier component has a period of this one by you. Okay. So now you have many pairs of antenna. So you are measuring many pairs of the Fourier components of the brightness temperature fluctuation on the sky. And by squaring, so now by cross-correlating, you see we want to calculate the power spectrum. 
So power spectrum is basically the amplitude of the Fourier mode square. So by cross correlating the different visibilities, we can directly estimate the power spectrum of the brightness temperature fluctuation. This is the basic idea that we are using. So we are measuring, we take the measured visibility that we cross correlate them and we use this to estimate the power spectrum of the 21 centimeter brightness temperature fluctuations. Okay. Yeah. So, and the depth. So we don't get the depth information from this, but the depth information is there in the frequency. So each frequency corresponds to a different depth. So we can also get the Fourier mode along the line of sight. Fourier mode in the plane of the sky comes from the baseline and the Fourier mode along the line of sight comes from the frequency separation. Okay. So we are trying to measure the power spectrum by taking measuring, taking two visibilities and correlating them. Okay. I hope this thing is clear. <clears throat> right. So this is the basic idea. Again, I have... <coughs> I, I, I have tried to explain this here in some more detail. So what is the basic idea? So you have a, an array like this. You have an array like this of many antennas. And as they go around, as the earth goes around, you have many baselines for which you have the reading. Each baseline corresponds to a particular K perpendicular on the sky. Because the hydrogen radiation at a particular frequency is some distance. Right? So you can convert this to a Fourier mode in the plane of the sky, k perpendicular. The depth information comes from the frequency separation. So you have k parallel, k perpendicular. And then you use this visibility now to get the power spectrum, pk. So the, the thing that we want to do is from the visibilities, we want to estimate the power spectrum of the brightness and temperature fluctuation. And the relation is given here. Right. So this was uh, presented in a paper by Shiv and I. So again, 25, no, 23 years ago, roughly. Okay. <clears throat> so, we are all old people now. <clears throat> kind of. Right. So, basically, this tells you the correlation between visibilities and the power spectrum. And uh, so, we use this to uh, measure the power spectrum. We have to invert this relation to measure the power spectrum. And <clears throat> we will get the power spectrum as a function of k perpendicular and k parallel. k perpendicular directly corresponds to the baseline. The frequency separation will give us k perpendicular. Okay. Right. So now I'm going to tell you about some work which we have been doing. This work has been carried out in collaboration with these three people who, sorry, I think I've pressed some wrong button. Maybe it's indicating my time is up. I don't know. <clears throat> So anyway, uh, so Swamit Choudhury, who is now at IIT Madra, Madras, uh, Sujita Pal, who is a postdoc at ISC Bangalore, Asif Elahi, who is now completing his PhD. So we have been working on developing this tapered gridded estimator. And there are other people also, a large number of other people who have been collaborating in this. So they have been collaborating more intensely. The, the entire collaboration includes many other people whose names are there. Okay. And there are many other people like Shape, etc., who have also contributed to this in a, at an earlier stage. Okay, so what is this idea? Let me uh, just briefly tell you about this. So you see what the problem of foregrounds, one of the main things in the problem of foregrounds is the antenna beam pattern. You see, when you have a dish antenna like this, the its response to the sky it has a beam pattern that looks like these. So this is actually the diffraction pattern of an aperture, of the aperture of this dish. There are these side loops, which I'm sure all of you are familiar with. It's roughly a sink square or a, the, vessel, uh, the uh, vessel function square. Okay. So the maximum radiation comes in through the primary lobe here, but there are these side lobes which have, which are well suppressed, but if there is a strong point source here, then it will produce a large foreground contamination. Okay, the signal we are trying to detect is extremely faint, and the sky has got very bright point sources. So even if it comes to a side low, it will make a very high contribution. Okay, and you can directly relate the angle, the angle at which the source is located with respect to the telescope's direction to this line in the k-parallel, k-perpendicular plane. Okay, and this line is the horizon that is some source located here. 
So if you can now suppress the contribution from point sources which are at large angle away, you are looking in this direction. Okay. But if a, there is a bright point source somewhere at a very large distance angle from this, that can make a very large contribution to the foreground, then that will appear somewhere here. So our idea is that if you can reduce the side lobe response, so to do, to do this, what we are doing, we are convolving the visibilities with a tapering function, which effectively <laughs> reduces the side lobe response. Okay, I'm not going to the technical details of this, but the idea is to convolve the measured visibilities with some window function to reduce the side lobe response. And we are using this estimator to estimate the power spectrum. So this shows you a validation of the estimator. We have been working with GMRT data, which is very highly flagged. So you see, if you do an observation with GMRT, you may have to throw away large amounts of data because of radio frequency interference and various other things. This picture here shows you the flagging of the GMRT data, which we have used. Okay. You may think that the white part is what you have and the black part is what is thrown away. It is actually the other way around. The white part is not there and only the black part is there. Okay. So you can imagine the kind of data that we have to work with, highly flagged data. So we have validated this estimator for this kind of data. It seems to work perfectly fine. And then we have also applied it to actually, actually analyze 150 megahertz data. And uh, this is a cylindrical power spectrum which we have got. You can see that this is all foreground here. All of this is foreground. We could identify a very small region here, which seems to be relatively free of foregrounds. And we use that to estimate the power spectrum. And this is the kind of limit that we got, very poor limits. But our aim was to demonstrate the estimator and show that you can actually do something with the GMRT. Uh, we have continued to work with this so this is another observation at a lower at a lower redshift or higher frequency, the so-called band fee of the UGMRT, more recent observations. And uh, we have been developing various techniques for analyzing this data. Uh, this actually now has been published with the last paper submitted. Now, where is it? There is one paper which is. Anyway, I shall come to it, right? So we have, yeah, this is the final result. Yeah, in this one, this has now been accepted. So we have also developed the method for foreground removal. You can see that this picture of the power spectrum, all of these modes are contaminated by foregrounds. We have developed a method for subtracting, for removing the foregrounds basically after the, from the observed visibilities. And we have a, we, uh, we have some estimate of the, uh, power spectrum using this estimator. Okay. Let, let me not go into all the details of this, may not interest you very much. Let me straight away jump to the uh, summary. So I have tried to give you an idea of what of what this field is about, 21 centimeter, probing the universe with the H1 21 centimeter line. And you can use this in principle, to observe nearly the entire evolution of the universe, all the way from the dark ages to the present. The largest, the biggest challenge is foregrounds. We have been working on developing this tapered graded estimator, which is a fast estimator, which works directly with the visibility measured in radio temperature observations. And we have been developing methods for mitigating the problem of foregrounds. We have made some progress, which I have tried to tell you about. Thank you. So thank you, Sundar, for this wonderful talk and very <clears throat> clear uh, description of the uh, simple technology. The question. Also, the one of the morals of the story to me and the other APN people here is that we are big supporters of 21 centimeter cosmology. So whenever they do an observation, what they throw away it is what we use. So, first of all, sir, it was a really very informative talk. <laughs> <laughs>
probably the second time I was listening to 24 centimeter and the first time I made some sense of what actually it is. Because last time I did hear about it, I was practically blank. So thank you for that. Uh, I, my question is actually from the when we first part of your talk, where you were explaining the spin temperature part. Over there, you uh, showed something in the slide about T star. I was a little bit confused about what exactly was the T star uh, in that spin temperature. T star is, uh, there's a factor, right? E to the power minus H nu by KBT. Correct. I mean, the Boltzmann factor is E to the power minus. The, basically, delta. <laughs> Yeah, delta E by KBT. Uh, if, there, if there are two states, it will be delta E by KBT, right? Yeah. Okay. So that delta E by KB, that factor is what it is. Okay, so it's uh, kind, of a, uh, kind of a constant like. Uh, For this transition, it's a constant. And uh, in the second part of uh, talk, where you were showing that. I mean, to be precise, it is the energy difference in units of Kelvin. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, and the later part of the talk, where you're showing the spin temperature was uh, showing a deviation from the gas temperature towards the KMP temperature. That uh, uh, distortion, uh, what exactly was it causing? I was a little unclear about that part. I mean, uh, why is it flipping from the. Okay, gas okay. So, you see, there, if you look at the evolution of, see, there are two states, right? So, the question that you're asking is what decides the population of these two yeah, states? Right. right. So, there will be. <clears throat> There are various processes which cause, which can cause the hydrogen atom to go from one state to the other. Okay. There are radiative processes, for example. So there is the uh, spontaneous emission, spontaneous. So so even if there is no radiation, uh, it can uh, it can it will de-excite, right? And then there is stimulated uh, absorption. If there is radiation, it will absorb. And if, so if there is the same be there, right? So that will cause excitation yeah, of the yeah. energy and it will cause de excitation. Right? So that if it comes to equilibrium, it will come to equilibrium at the same bit temperature. Okay. And there is also collision. So collision between the atoms can change the spin, can cause the spin to flip. Okay. So that, that will try to bring the temperature to the gas temperature. Because the, the collision is basically the motion of the it will try to bring the spin temperature in equilibrium with the motion, the kinetic temperature of the gas. So there are these two competing processes. There is a third process which is not important here, but there is a third process that is uh, that is due to ultraviolet. That's uh, uh, if if there were excite uh, ultraviolet radiation present, then uh, it could uh, de-excite and excite the uh, electrons to the excited level and then down, and that could also contribute. But that doesn't play a role here. It plays a role at lower redshifts during cosmic dawn or at later. Okay, that's called the Buddhism field effect. But during the dark ages, that doesn't picture. So there are only two processes. One is the CMB, which causes radiative transitions, and there are collisional transitions. So one has to write down the equations and solve them. You will get that term. And uh, the contribution from these two processes are being like calculated mathematically. Like right. Yeah. So there are equations and there are coefficients, right? There are the Einstein coefficients and the collision uh, collision coefficient, it's collisional excitation and de excitation coefficients, which people have calculated using quantum mechanics. So as far as we are concerned, they'll be calculated in the somewhere. Oh, thank, you. thank you. As a function of temperature. <laughs> Thanks for the very nice structure. Um, can you go to the slide where you showed the you know the temperature map after the uh, like the point source subtraction? Like what it was the slide of only the diffuse uh, synchrotron. Uh, yeah, so this color map is only for the diffuse. Oh, well, this is what we have. Okay, we think it is. I'm I'm not saying this is only diffuse, but it has it seems to show some. Yeah, so that's what I was wondering. So if it is if it shows it seems to be very clustered for a diffuse emission, right? Do you see that the bright points are quite clustered in open now the field? Maybe it's not uniform at all. No, it is not uniform, definitely there, yeah. otherwise you not get a power spectrum. Yeah, so that's but the, but no, no the, the fact that there is something there is basically diffuse. It is we are saying it is diffuse because. We, we have removed the small, the large KMOs. When making this image, 
we have not taken the contribution from the small circle. Okay. okay. So we have only taken the small base. Okay. Thanks for the wonderful class. I was wondering regarding the program sources. So uh, the synchrotron is one, then the side load response problem is another which we are using using the traffic. Now I was wondering whether uh, since we are dealing with very low frequency observation, and also it's a long observation, like you said, two hours of observation, that the baseline, uh, uh, you showed a baseline map. So the stay vector, it's, 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 uh, it's scanning uh, different lines of sight. Not, uh, it is booming, yeah. Okay. So uh, I was wondering whether the uh, ISM inside our galaxy itself, like the stellar medium, whether the dispersion from the ISM uh, also lead to any foreground artifacts in your data? Uh, does it does it cause any uh, effect uh, in your data? Uh, is it a source of foreground as well? No, no, no. IS, this is the ISM, right? This is the uh, ionized interstellar medium. Okay, okay, so it's uh, also so what we are measuring there is the ISM basically. This is the interstellar uh, ionized interstellar medium. This okay. okay, it is the basically the plasma. Yeah, thanks. The synchrotron is coming from the ISM. Yeah, uh, so I was just curious about the. Uh, the paper is the, the slide. Can you go there? Uh, yeah, that function that you showed. Yes, this one. So, uh, theta is what the mean size or no, no, no. Theta so, uh, no. Uh, see, so uh, see the for example. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, that is the uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm going the wrong way. Sorry. Oh. It's all it's other way. These are the extra styles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So theta is the angle from the point, the direction in which I'm pointing. Yes, that's fine. Right. right. Now what I want it? to suppress so you see the the without anything, the uh, telescope will have some beam pattern which I'm calling A of theta. Okay. okay. So that will have these side loads. Oh, that's the primary beam primary pattern. Primary beam pattern. Okay. Right. Now what we want to do is we want to suppress the side loads. So what we are doing is that you see we have these visibilities, right? I mentioned for baselines. So we are taking we are when we are gridding them, we are going to we convolve them with this weight W, yeah. the Fourier transform of that weight actually. Yeah. Right. W theta. That is a we take it to be a Gaussian. That's right. So we choose some function. That's how what's that function? The theta W. That is in the exponential. Oh, that is just a constant. Okay. That, that is how big, how much I want to take. How much you want to take. Right. And so how do you determine that? That's how much you want to take. Well, beyond a certain tapering, nothing changes. So let me see if I have a slide. Uh, sorry. You are doing it to the power minus theta square. That's right. That's a pretty aggressive tapering. And then theta omega is also, uh, theta w is also high. So then it's not. No, you don't want to get rid of all the signal also, right? Just a minute. Oh, sorry. Anyway, you don't want to get rid of all the signal, right? So you do a tapering and uh, you taper till you find that you don't get any improvement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, other questions? Finally, it is empirical. What a precise value. Basically, I mean, I was just wondering, uh, your, uh, your, uh, you said that you had a contribution in the, uh, to, uh, by considering the procedural. Right, right. 
So, uh, I mean, what do you assume? Essentially, oh, the peculiar motions. <laughs> so, so what, I mean, why I'm saying this is that uh, if the galactic dynamics uh, is also part of the peculiar motion. No, no, it is not the galactic dynamics. Or 